Well, a very good afternoon to all those on the West Coast. Good early evening here on the East Coast. Good evening to all our European friends. This is episode number 149 of Material Issues. I'm Mark Hirschberger of Pop Detective Records, popdetective.com. Check it out. Brand new website. I'm over here in South Jersey where it's been a beautiful sunny day. And my good friend out there on the West Coast, just outside of L.A., Mr. David Bash, the president of the International Pop Overthrow Festival, which is about to get going in first gear, second gear, fourth gear, all the gears. It's coming up and coming strong. David, how are you doing tonight? Is I'm okay, you? Mark. How are you? Yeah, I, whatever yeah it's really warm here. It's a, <clears throat> it's about 85 right now. Nice. So, nice. <clears throat> yeah, of course. Um, well, first I should say, uh, Rena and I are going to Boston on the latest red eye you can possibly get 1159 uh, tonight <laughs> yeah. and uh, we're going to be there for a couple of days we head back sunday morning early um just uh, rena's dad passed away a year ago we had the he was from boston we had the funeral there and now we're going to do the un haha and now we're going to do the unveiling of uh, the tombstone uh so we're heading back right. for that and uh, we're scheduled to see a game at Fenway, nice. um, which I've never done. So uh, yeah. it's supposed to rain. Hopefully, um, from what it looks like, the rain's supposed to stop by noon. So I have a feeling the game will get in. Keep my fingers crossed. Very nice. Um, so we've got that. Where are uh, the streets yeah. in, in relation to the uh, Big Green Monster? Pardon? I have, you know what? I don't even know where we're oh, okay. I figured It's kind of a family thing. Rena got a whole bunch of tickets for, for family members. And, hey, uh, Rich. Good afternoon, Rich. Good to see you. Um, and, uh, oh, a couple of days ago, we had, had an interesting thing happen. Um, I'm watching the ball game, Yankees. Not a fan of the Red Sox at all, mm -hmm. but I want to go to the game anyway. Um, to, and the game wasn't boring at all, but I was, was kind of tired, so I took a little nap. I wake up, I look outside my front window, and a tree has fallen. A fair, you know, a decent sized tree um, has fallen onto our front porch. Um, and it, it the, the top of the tree got about a foot away from our window. So thank God it didn't it didn't break yeah. our window. It uh, collapsed our our little picket fence on the front porch a bit. Um, we had the our gardener came the next day, uh, chopped it up, cut it out of there. We were able to put the fence back up. It's not quite, it's not as sturdy as it was. And some of the little pickets had bent, but it looks, uh, it, you know, it look it looks okay given what happened. So we were, yeah, we were very fortunate. But, but I heard you got a pair of ruby red slippers out of the deal. So you're fine. There is no place like home after all. <laughs> hey, speaking of baseball, look what I just got in. It's uh, three autographs. You see Gene Thompson, Jay Rode, but the one on the bottom, Willard Hirschberger. Wow. The only Major League Baseball player in history to have killed himself during the regular season. No, it's, it's true. The hat that, um, apparently... He, uh, Ernie Lombardi, the regular Reds catcher, um, this is 1940, I think. Yeah. Uh, 1940, yep. Yep. The regular Reds catcher got hurt. Hershberger was forced into action. He didn't, he put a lot of pressure on himself. He didn't feel he was delivering. I mean, it's hard to live up to Lombardi, who was an all star player. Yep. Yep. He didn't feel he was delivering. And I'm sure he had other issues going on because you don't just end your life over something like that. But apparently that was enough. Yep. To, uh, to cause him to end his life, which was really tragic. I, there had been a, there have been other ball players who've committed suicide, but never during the season. Right. Yeah. And the Reds like the win the is what keeps them going generally. So. Yeah, the Reds went on to win the World Series, and they voted to give him a full share to his uh, to his widow, yeah. which is kind of cool. Um, hey, Gary. But uh, yeah, so I got that in today. Of course, I got the CD version of the Sandy Salisbury. Oh, yeah. Uh, mellow as sunshine that the bonus tracks on the C the album i got the album as well the vinyl's wonderful but the bonus tracks on the uh on the cd are spectacular right i have to i have to do this and i have to make that yeah that's definitely a uh what's the word i'm looking for um 
a pet peeve when people they're all albums all right eight uh <laughs> lps cds eight tracks cassettes all albums so you got the vinyl and the cd you did not get the album and the cd the that's CD right is that's not. right i got the vinyl and you're right i got the vinyl and the cd the album is different because it's not as much on the vinyl right. as it is bonus of the cd so i got that in i got this great thing from something weird modern harmonics it's uh it's intermission time which is all like the drive-in movie movie uh, little little oh, clips like that. let's all go to the lobby and right right things like that which is which is very cool cool but strange. you know who does that song sometimes live dave rave dave rave excellent yeah <laughs> And then uh, Apollon Records a few years ago, and I never knew about it, but they put out all the all the, all the reissues of the uh, Pogo Pops uh, CDs. Oh wow! Um, in 2015, I can't really get them in there, but that's all the Pogo Pops, and I found them. I found them, picked them up, even though I have the original issues. I figured maybe there's bonus tracks or something. There's it's just a, a, a repackaging. Of I may, yeah, let, uh, let me know later how to get those if they're around. Cause. I just found it on eBay, so and it, it was just a, a CD seller. I'd have you'd have to look. Uh, I have lots of vinyls, John. I like LP and CD. CD Thank CD you, Rich. Yeah, that's that was always the the UK when CDs came about in the UK. They just they always called the record an LP, and uh, and they called the, the CD a CD, but they always considered both to be albums. So, but as I said, that's all pogo pop stuff. Everybody's familiar. That's Frank Hammersland, who was on our show uh, shortly before he passed away um, with Popium and his solo material. And uh, I heard from his wife uh, a few days ago that there is one more album posthumously coming out of uh, Frank's work. Uh, and um, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. So if you're a Hammer Slam, Popium, Pogo Pops fan, we got a little bit more from from a wonderful singer songwriter. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about somebody who we don't have to honor posthumously because right. he's still with us. In fact, he's with us down in our queue. We're going to bring him up into the studio in just a bit. Uh, I first became familiar with this gentleman when i heard his band his late 70s band size 14 who a uh, la band epitomized geek rock i've got the album right here <laughs> great titles like sleeping in the wet spot super babe <laughs> let's rob a bank i touched her ass a lot of great songs but that that is, yeah that just epitomized geek rock and they were fun i got to see them play um that's where i said hi to the to them I must have made some impression uh, because a couple of years later, he contacted me. Well, he just out of the blue sent me a cassette. He said, um, this is my new album. I'd love to know what you think. And of course, I expected more kind of size 14 stuff. And then I put it on and I was absolutely blown away. I, uh, first of all, I was astonished because it was so different. And secondly, it was so good just filled with soft pop and power pop and just beautiful melodies and just very, very earnest lyrics and everything was so different about it and so good. And um, I had started IPO a year before and I invited him to play and he played his first ever show at uh, IPO LA in 1999. And uh, I'll never forget that. I'm always honored when somebody deigns to have their first show with us. Uh, over the years, he's released several great albums, including, uh, I'm going to show a few of them here, including the aforementioned Your Favorite Record. That was what that cassette eventually became. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and there's actually a few different covers of it I have here. Um, uh, this is a Japanese version. And this, of course, is my favorite cover. I don't have to explain why. I guess. <laughs> I hope. Uh, I hope he has her phone number because. <laughs> so is that one of your burning questions tonight? Is the phone number? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, a few years later, he put out another album, which, uh, you know, was uh, kind of an extension of what he was doing. And the title says okay. it all: "Let Yourself Be Happy," which is sometimes a difficult thing to do, but it's always a good idea if you can. Um, here's another, I think this is a Japanese version of that as well. 
See, I, I'm 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 a geek rock guy too. You're, you're a on all yeah. the different versions of these albums. <laughs> then came Triangle a few years later. Hey Nigel. Hey Nigel. Again, more really. I mean, it's all it's all just a great mixture of soft pop, power pop, a little bit of folk rock, some lullaby types. I mean, there's stuff that children would certainly like. Something good from Excellent. 2014. And then his latest and possibly greatest, as great as, as much as I love his first album, I may like Cabin Life even more. And I'm honored that on the uh, front page of his website, he has my review of that album, to which I gave five, st yeah. five, five stars on Shindig. Also, a tremendous songwriter, has written for a varied uh, number of people in all kinds of different genres. It's like, you know... You, you, he can write anything, even though even if he doesn't play it, he can write it. Um, he's had songs appear on soundtracks, including one of my favorite shows ever, Californication. Californication, yeah. <laughs> and he's he's apparently working on another record. Yes, we, we certainly can't wait for that. So nice anyway, show. I could go on and on. But without further ado, would you please give a huge material issues welcome to Mr. Linus of Hollywood. And there hey. he is. <laughs> and there he is. Hey, everyone. I think the intro could have just gone on for half an hour with uh, with your resume, Linus. My gosh. Uh, I mean. I appreciate the kind you of got, You got it. You still have her number? Uh, you you want to know some interesting trivia, David? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's Casey Kasem's daughter, Carrie Kasem. Oh. Oh, my gosh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, yeah, she, she happened to be good friends with my ex, and then when we did that, uh, we did that cover. She was around, and she's like, "I'll do it," and we're like, "Okay." And uh, <laughs> when I put that out, my idea was because uh, uh, I had just started my new label, Franklin Castle, at that time. The original album had come out on Pop Squad, so I wanted to sort of re uh, reissue my record, even though it was only a year year later. And my idea going forward was to have kind of like remember those Pirelli calendars, like the Italian Pirelli. Oh, yeah. so I kind of to do something like that where every cover had like uh you know uh, a model on the front just to sort of give it that kind of european flair or whatever and uh but when i put that out uh i don't know if you remember but it caused quite a quite a, uh, <laughs> Sorry, look at that quite a scandal in the power pop community and i actually got some just emails uh from people like why are you doing this and uh i remember really uh, yeah yeah it was it was pretty controversial at the time which i i wasn't thinking of it in a sort of blatantly obscene kind of way i was thinking of it as like a 70s kind of vintagey playboy -y kind of thing you know what i mean so yeah, it's yeah. Not obscene. it's all right, a little suge suggestive i mean boys yeah, are gonna I, like it i mean obviously i mean uh you know i have songs that i wrote uh many years ago like some of those size 14 titles that you <laughs> That you reeled off that I that I probably wouldn't uh, I probably wouldn't write a song called any of that today I've grown up a little bit but at the, at the same time it's rock and roll and it wasn't that uh, I didn't think it was that big of a deal but we ended up pulling all of those off the shelf and re putting the uh, original artwork back in so if if anyone out there has a copy of that cover there's really only about fifty of them in circulation before we wow it. so there you go oh the one I just the one I have here only fifty. Yeah, there's probably only about 50 of those. Yeah, I don't even know. I, I should look on Discogs and see if uh, see if uh, there's a there's a any value to that. There might there will be now. <laughs> yeah. I have an original pressing of the Margot Gurry and Take a Picture album that's still shrink wrapped, and it's now it's worth like twenty five hundred dollars or something. It's crazy. It's amazing. I mean, I'm never gonna sell it because Margot gave it to me. But yeah, there's oh, my, yeah. oh there's, my god, there's, there's two, two of the 50, fifty right now. There's two of the fifty right here. Amazing. Very cool. All right, so, <laughs> of course, the first question I have, and, you know, uh, our listeners may already know, but in case they don't. Oh, wait, before you ask a question, yeah. I just want to say thank you for that amazing intro and all the kind words that you said. And I always tell people that you were the, the guy who helped spread my music to the world. Um, I came from the sort of, punk power, you know, sort of punk pop community, and I made this record that I thought no one would like. And you told everyone that it was good, and that was really the beginning of my my solo career. So I just want to say thank you, David. And I always say that whenever your name comes up, I'm always like, he's the guy who told everyone about my music. It, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for the music. I mean, when something 
as good as that come to my attention and moves me that much. I want other people to know about it. You know, yeah. as many because I knew there was an audience for it. It was it was really clear, and uh, it yeah. was just a matter of getting people to, to giving people awareness. So. Well, I just wanted to say thank you. And I see some people in the uh, the chat there, like John Borak and, and Rich Horton and other people who have definitely like uh, spread the word and uh, been yeah. kind and are part of the part of the scene. So uh, thank you to, to all of you guys for that. Our pleasure. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah so the question I want to ask, which is one you've been asked a million times, but some people here may not know. How... How did you get the name Linus of Hollywood? And were you Linus before you lived in Hollywood? No. Um, well, I was. my dad was in the military, so I moved all over the place. But I mostly lived in Florida. And I grew up as a – I was a heavy metal kid, so I had really long hair. And uh, somewhere around – well, obviously, 1992, um, you know, grunge came along and killed all the hair metal bands. So I was sort of walked around confused for a couple of years, but I had started started to get into uh, jellyfish. Obviously, was my life changing. Uh, I, I I sort of heard other people who grew up on metal have the same experience where they were metalheads, and then they heard jellyfish, and then they got into all the <laughs> pop stuff. Even the guy from the Cardigans actually has the same story. He was a metal guy, and he ended up really? jellyfish. jellyfish was his catalyst into the soft pop and all that kind of stuff. So wow. so so anyway, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I was 21 years old and I was wearing a lot of like striped shirts because I was really into jellyfish <laughs> and uh, I got a telemarketing job and uh, one of the guys at the telemarketing job was making fun of me because like no one in LA was dressing like that. And they're like, who's this weird kid with long hair and uh, striped shirts every day? So he said that I was dressing from the Peanuts collection and he wrote my name, like no one knew my name yet because I just moved to LA. So he wrote my name up on the sales board as Linus. So everyone just started calling me Linus. And my I grew up as Kevin Dotson, which is a boring ass name. So I was just like, <laughs> I was like, this is pretty cool. I have a nickname. And so I just kind of went with it. And then when uh, Science 14 came out, my name was just Linus. I didn't even have a last name. I was kind of like uh, Sting or Cher or Madonna or something. It was just Linus. Uh, and then I, when I went solo, um, I just sort of did, I wanted to sort of add to it because there was another band called Linus. So there was like uh, other, oh. I, just, I needed it to be slightly more original. So um, there was a uh, Fredericks of Hollywood that was on the, uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. And I, I really, I really loved uh, living in Hollywood at the time. So I thought it would be fun to like sort of put that in my name. Um, and people just think it's funny because I'm not a very like, Hollywood kind of guy. I think people sort of have this image of me, like what I look like or how I am based on my name and my music. But then when you meet me, I'm just like a, a dork. So, <laughs> so anyway, the, the whole thing, I thought it was funny. I mean, even my record label, uh, Franklin Castle, was sort of a goof because I lived in a really crappy apartment on Franklin Avenue, but I wanted it to sound like it was like some majestic uh, thing. You know, that, that was back in the time when there was all those labels like Minty Fresh and Parasol and all these things. And so I just wanted something that sounded like a power pop thing. But the joke was that if anyone came over to my house, it was a terrible. <laughs> Anything terrible but a castle. <laughs> well, you know what? You can call me Charlie Brown of Reseda. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe or maybe Telly Savalas of Reseda. You know, you you're a big you're a big early 70s uh you, you know uh soft pop guy. Did you ever hear Telly Savalas's version of If? No, I did not. I didn't, I didn't even know he did music. That's amazing. It it meant went to number one in the UK. Kojak was a huge show over there. Wow. And um yeah, and it, it's all spoken word. So he doesn't attempt. He doesn't attempt to sing. It's spoken word with music in the background. Wasn't and, there someone that just died? That was like I think it, some. He was on like a Starsky and Hus, H Starsky and Hutch or something like that. Oh, Paul that Michael him? Glazer. No, David Soul passed away. David yeah. Soul. And he like did a song, right? Oh yeah. Well, don't give up on us. Was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, I knew that song. In the States too. Yeah. Yeah, I know that song so well, and I had no idea it was the guy from Starsky and Hutch. Starsky and Hutch, yeah. Well, at, least, at least he could carry a tune. <laughs> but oh, Telly yeah. knew better. He knew he couldn't. But, yeah, he spoke it in kind of a very earnest way, and 
they hard they, to sing with a lollipop in your mouth. You know? he didn't, yeah, you didn't have the. <laughs> he, he did like he did like a William Shatner type thing where he just sort of yeah, yeah yeah you could find the album probably for ten cents in a lot of places. So. <laughs> Amazing. Well, maybe I'll find it. It's so funny, uh, everyone watching. I always run into David at the record store. I've like, like ran into him like uh, three times in the past few months. Just like, oh hey David, we're at the record store again. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah, different record stores. We kept running into each other. Which yeah, was, that's like that's my pastime. I I live on the east side of Los Angeles. And there's all these record stores popping up. So literally once a week I hit every single one of them and just go through the go through the new arrivals and see what's going on. Well, yeah, look out for that telly album. You don't want to miss it. Uh, <laughs> but you 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 moved around a lot as a kid. Um in the in the midst of that, um, what was your first instrument? And, and did you learn it on your own or were you taught? Uh my first instrument was guitar. And I just taught myself how to play. I remember my parents, I I, I, uh, I have a picture of myself and I'm like two years old and I've got headphones on and I'm listening to Kiss rock and roll over. <laughs> and my parents just knew I loved music and no one in my family is musical at all. Like, like I don't know where I got it from. And so they just, they tried to buy me a guitar but my fingers weren't big enough yet. And then when I think I was about four or five, I could finally like put my fingers on the thing. So I just bought one of those like Mel Bay like instructional books or whatever. And I just taught myself how to play. And then when I was probably like nine or 10, I got proper lessons. And this guy, he, this guy was kind of like a Brian Setzer kind of guy. And he taught me how to play bar chords and, and uh, my favorite solos. And, uh, and like, I remember learning hello by Lionel Richie and uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Stray, Stray Cat Strut. And uh, I made him teach me living after midnight by Judas Priest and, uh, you know, things like that. And then uh, when I lived in Iowa, there was this like studio and uh, I would go for an hour and a half and I would take drums for half an hour, guitar for half an hour, and then synthesizer programming for half an hour, which was oh, really wow. interesting. It wasn't even playing. It was just like learning all the knobs, like oscillators and all that kind of stuff. And so that was a pretty cool experience to have as a, as a little kid. I don't think. Well, it gave you a great bass too. My gosh. Uh, you know, for everything you're going to do down the road, it was a. Exactly, I was going to say. I mean, you, all these these, so these songs you were talking about were all of different genres. So, uh, do you think do you think that that helped? Do, do you think that helped shape you as a songwriter, enabling you to write in so many different genres? Uh, maybe I think so. I think basically just my love for music. I just I just love so many different genres of music. I think the through line in everything I like is like classic songwriting. It's some sort of pop structure. So like, for instance, I'm not really a huge jazz person, but if jazz is done in a pop style, like if Chet Baker is singing or Astrid Gilberto or something like that, then I love it because it's like a song. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so it's the same with anything. Like I love, I mean, I grew up on metal. I got into, when I, when I figured out that girls liked uh, Bon Jovi, then I sort of got more into that, <laughs> that style of uh, hard rock and learning how to write. I mean, honestly, Bon Jovi was kind of like my Beatles because that's how I learned how to write big choruses and sing harmonies and all that kind of stuff because i didn't really know anything about the beatles or the beach boys uh until really? i mean other than just like hearing good vibrations on the sun kissed commercial and like you know just random things like that i just it just wasn't on my radar my parents didn't listen to any of that stuff so it really was jellyfish i think i think i was probably about 18 or 19 when jellyfish came out um, and I remember I joined the fan club, which is funny because it was not called joining a fan club. And I got this list of Andy Sturmer's uh, top five favorite albums. And it was Odyssey and Oracle by yeah. the Zombies, Rubber Soul by the Beatles, uh, Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys, Sail Away by Randy Newman. Uh, and there was one other that I can't remember, but I immediately went to the record store and I bought all those records and I just put them on. And it, like, it's crazy that I'd never had, had heard Pet Sounds, but I put it on. I was just like, oh, my God, this is where they're getting all this stuff from. <laughs> and it was just kind of like this this epiphany. Um, so, yeah, I was like super late bloomer on the power pop stuff. Did sure. that lead you to discover other things like Queen, Raspberries, Badfinger, other early 70s stuff? Yeah, for sure. Like once I got the bug for it, I got really into it. like when I when I first met you, I mean, I was getting into like the yellow balloon and grapefruit and like all those like really obscure things because I just couldn't like get enough of it. And that's what was crazy when I heard Margot Gurian's record because no one had heard it yet. And it was like uh, I mean, it was like in the bargain bins, basically. And and uh, when John played it for me, I'm like, oh, my God, this is like if if Astra Gilberta was singing on, on top of Odyssey and Oracle, <laughs> I'm like, this is so cool. 
So, so yeah, I was just like super hungry. But, but even to this day, like the reason you see me at the record store all the time is because I just pick out bands where I know the hits, but I don't know the albums necessarily. Oh, album, and, and most of it's like late. I, I, my sweet spot is like late seventies, maybe super early eighties. But like, you know, a couple months ago, I was like, oh, the babies. I love John Waits' voice. I know the hit songs, but I've never like listened to the album. So I went to Record Safari where I saw you. They had all the albums for like two or three dollars in like perfect condition. So I literally bought them all for like thirteen bucks fan them out like a deck of cards and then for the next like week or two i just sat and listened to the whole album like like you used to do when you're a kid you know like now we have like spotify now so you can literally just like pick any song but it's so nice to buy an album and i sort of just like it's like i, I savor like a box of chocolates or something you know like i just buy the one album and i listen to it for the whole week you know what i mean and well then, exactly Be, it, back back in the day thank you we're you know david and i are, are fairly fairly elderly anymore but you know you, you bought an album and you played it from side one track number one to side or b side side a side b in the order that the band wanted you to hear it in yeah. and that's that's why it's yeah it's like it's like a photo album the first photo tells a story all the way to maybe the 12th or 14th photo that's why you put it in that order my 29 year old daughter loves to collect albums vinyl albums and she loves to listen to it from a track one all because she says the same thing this is how they wanted you to hear it for sure and she's for not sure. picking and choosing you know and, and i i think that's wonderful i think it's amazing it's yeah uh, it was so cool to have two sides too because it yep. was like it was like two sequences basically like the thing that you put as the beginning of side two was was important as well now now on on the digital albums that's just in the middle of the album but but uh, and we, you're and always, we could talk about eight tracks and and that debacle. <laughs> yes, but there was always something great after you know the A side to get up, you know, flip the flip the thing over, put yes. it back down. And and it's actually good for me. I do a lot of stuff on the computer, so it's good for me to get up every fifteen minutes and flip the records. <laughs> Perfect. It's, it's no, no, I think a lot of us started that way. I mean, my first albums were were the Beatles, Red and Blue, and then you know I started buying best ofs greatest hits of people I liked. Then all of a sudden, then I bought, uh, you know, the regular Beatles albums, which were really good. And I thought, you know what? If the Beatles have so many good albums, maybe some of these other groups do too. Maybe. I just experimented, you know, uh, I was, a, I, I bought Endless Summer and loved it. So let's get some Beach Boys albums. Let's get some McCartney albums. Let's start getting albums by, by groups that had hits that I heard on the radio. Yeah. So it, it kind of sprung, it, it sprung from that. Absolutely. Well, sometimes even the bad songs are interesting and it becomes part of why you like an album. I mean, I mean, Paul McCartney is my favorite Beatles, so I don't, I'm not disparaging him, but he has a couple albums where not every song is amazing, but like you wouldn't trade in those songs because it's part of the album. And you know right, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so maybe you wonder. Nina Crory. No, never mind. Uh, <laughs> and it's awesome, but then again. Like, it made you think. It made you think. You know why? Why did he put this on this? Why this song? You know why? You know whenever it, yeah, you know, whatever for whatever reason. But it was part of the experience. And uh, absolutely. It, it, okay, it, so well, when was your? Uh, what was your first band, and where were you at that time? The first band that I was in. Yeah. Uh, I was in Florida. I was 15 years old, and I had a band called Nightfall. And we were just a local heavy metal band. We all looked like we were in Bon Jovi. I had like hilarious pictures of me when I was 15 with like uh, poofy hair and I'm wearing eyeliner. And my my military father from the South did not like uh, the fact that his son was wearing spandex pants. And, uh, <laughs> and how, how old were you at this point? I was 15 years old. And it was crazy because everyone in my band was like between 15 and 17, I guess. And, but we were playing clubs like we were we were the biggest band in our town. So whenever the national acts would come through, we would open for them. So we opened up for like all the big bands of, of the time, which would be like uh, Firehouse and Steelheart and, uh, you know, those those kind of bands. But we also opened up for uh, legacy bands that came through. Like we opened up for Blue Oyster Colt. We opened up Whoa. for Funk Cap. And we literally would have to like sneak into the club because we weren't supposed to be there because we we're under 21. Right. We play the show and then they would throw us out, basically. <laughs> um but yeah it was pretty pretty crazy time and we were all dating like 
girls that were like 20 or 21 or something, which I, which is a very Florida thing, I guess. But uh, maybe some <laughs> maybe some legal aspects to that. But yeah, it was a very very <laughs> wild. It, I, I pretty much had like a full life before I even turned 21, just like living in that time and that environment because it was very just like fun party time. Um, Florida. Yeah. What part, what part of Florida were you down South? Uh, uh, I lived in the, uh, what's called the space coast. So I lived in a small town called satellite beach. It's right by Melbourne and Cocoa beach and Cape Canaveral. So like, nice. like nice. I saw the, the shuttle explode like in person, Whoa. They used to let us out of the class to watch the shuttle launches and wow. And, yeah. So wow. sorry, so, sorry to bring the party down, but, but yeah, it was very, very close. Oh. <laughs> As long as nobody starts crying here, we're good. We've had people cry on our show. So well, you guys started off the show with a suicide story, so it can only go up. Yeah, we like to we like to we like to take it to a very small level and then build it up from there. So yeah. <laughs> Nightfall. Ah, well, fantastic. Well, and then uh, were you writing it at all at this point? Were you? Uh, yeah. So um, we we started out as just a cover band, and then uh, I was like, oh, we need to have originals, and uh, uh, I was like, well, I guess I'll have to figure out how to write songs. So I just started writing songs and they started out being very generic and then they got popular and popular and then as just as i got more into songwriting my tastes got also more poppy um because like when i was when i was a really young kid i was into the heavier metal i was into like slayer and metallica and all that kind of stuff and then when i got in a band and i realized that girls like uh, bon jovi and and uh and lover boy and all that kind of stuff then i went i went in that direction <laughs> I just went after the girls, basically. That was my thing. Hey, the, the motivation a, a common theme. Yeah, it's a very common theme through all our guests. Were, were you, were, girls. This is something I I really don't ask too many musicians because I know the answer. But were you? You know, I you're you're built pretty well. Were you an athlete also? Um, I played a lot of sports when I was a little little kid. Like I played um, soccer and baseball, and I was really good at basketball because I was taller than everyone else. Um, like it's funny that my first band was called Size 14. That's my shoe size, but I had a size oh. 14 shoe when I was 13 years old. So I was I was already like six foot. Wow. Two or something. So when I played basketball, uh, I was basically the team. Like if I had a bad day, then we lost, and if I had a good day, we won. It was that kind of thing. But not high school sports. At that point, it was all. No. Music. By the time I got, as soon as I heard Van Halen two, I'm like, <laughs> this is what I want to do. I started growing my hair, and I was like, but I also was like smoking cigarettes and drinking and doing drugs like you know it's very very florida uh, childhood so yeah i did i did not have a uh i did i did not pursue sports after that and also then <laughs> the sports guys were were the guys uh, making fun of me in school and calling calling me uh gay and all that kind of stuff because i had long hair and so i just really wow oh that's florida okay yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah it's, it's just high school basically <laughs> yeah, high school uh, was it was it jellyfish who motivated you to move out to la no, actually, uh, the reason I wanted to move out to LA is because, I mean, I was in that band and we had gotten, I think, about as big as you could possibly get. And uh, this was in, you know, the late 80s when, uh, you know, before the before the Internet, um, when the idea of someone signing you out of Florida seemed pretty impossible. There were there were a couple of bands in our scene that did get signed, like Saigon Kick and I guess Marilyn Manson started out as like a, a, a glam guy and then he got crazier after. But um, so it was like sort of possible, but it wasn't likely. And I just wanted to like be where the, be where the action was. So, uh, I basically moved to LA. I can't even believe I did this, but I moved to LA. I was 21. I had an acoustic guitar, one suitcase of clothes, and I moved in with a friend of a friend. I didn't even know anybody here. Wow. So I literally just came here and then I got my telemarketing job like after the first week. And then a month later, I was able to afford my own apartment. And then I just like got plugged in and figured it all out. But uh, but yeah. yeah, it's still it's still a gutsy move to leave leave a comfort zone and say this is where this one go do and and take next to nothing and go. You know? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I did it. I, I don't when I think back to that time. I can't imagine how I found the courage to do that, but uh, but I'm glad that I did. It was the best best decision I ever made. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't work out for the you know the the high, the high percentage of people that try that, but there are those that it does work out. For. And we've had a couple on the show who kind of did the similar thing. They packed up and landed with knowing nobody and got very lucky and yeah. turned into you know something something that made a life for them. And uh, yeah. I, that's fantastic. And so when you came when you came out here, 
<clears throat> did you immediately get immersed in the scene? Because things were really happening at that point. Yeah, so uh, I moved in May of 94, and the week after I moved out, um, Weezer, uh, Blue Album, came out. And so mm -hmm. I had spent between 1992 and 1994 going, like, just feeling really bummed because I just couldn't relate to, like, Pearl Jam and stuff like that where they weren't really putting on a show and they were just dressed like normal people. And I don't know, they just it just didn't appeal to me. And I remember Green Day, Dookie came out, and Weezer, Blue Album, came out. And I was like, okay, I can do this because they're playing power chords through a Marshall stack and it's melodic. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the Weezer guys were metalheads too. That's where their sense of melody had come from as well. And um, so I just sort of climbed on board that scene and that was a really big scene. Uh, it's funny, uh, do you know Steve Coulter at all from Zar? Well, yes. So he just wrote a book called Generation Blue and it's about all the bands that were influenced by Weezer in the mid nineties. Yep. So I was definitely part of that scene and, and we're, we're about to do a show <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm going to get up and do some size 14 songs and Nerf Herder is going to do it. But all the bands that are playing are bands from that scene who I used to go see when I first moved to LA, who really influenced me like uh, right all high. Uh, they used to be called lunchbox and I used yep. to love them. They were so good. Uh, Shuffle Puck was a band that I loved and they got signed to Interscope and they they made an amazing record and it got shelved that never came out but the album is amazing and it's cool that it's being released now. Uh, Campfire Girls. Um, yeah, so it's just uh, it's just crazy. Like it's a perfect like 30 year anniversary of me being in LA. Like like everything is just sort of coming full circle and yeah. just like this gig. And when, when is that show, by the way? Uh, that is... Um, the end of this month, actually, uh, I have to look. It's I think it's April. It's April twenty something. I can tell you right now. Uh, I'm gonna miss it then, probably. It's April twenty eighth. Oh, that's <laughs> maybe I can make it. That's the day I come back from IPO Chicago. I, I assume it's in the evening. Uh, I think it starts sort of in the late afternoon. It's you know it's uh it's uh. LA old people time. So we're trying to start the show early and get everyone. Home. Perfect for you, Dave. I may, I may have to run right straight from the airport to the show, but um, yeah, you, you should come down. I think it'll be I a, very well do that. I think it'd be a fun time. I wouldn't be surprised if someone from Weezer is there too. Cause like those guys are so in, in ensconced in the scene. I would, wouldn't be surprised if like Matt Sharp got up and did something. I, I don't know that officially, but I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I'm actually in the generation blue book. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah, I mean, he, Steve asked me some stuff about IPO and and the scene back in the day, and so I, you know, I gave my two cents. So it's you, nice to be in there. You'd be the guy to ask for sure. I, I was just the kid uh, going to the whiskey every Monday night. I had a free night, and you would go see bands like That Dog and Chopper One and uh, Red Five, and every every band had a number in their name. I guess I don't know. And you you came you came in at a really I mean, fruitful time because a lot of bands were getting signed, especially out of Silver Lake, um, the whole Dust Brothers thing. And uh, and then um, DreamWorks coming about and signing those kind of bands. Uh, and of course, Geffen signing Weezer and everything. Um, so you must I mean, I assume that you probably felt because you've always struck me as a very confident guy. So you probably felt like your chances were pretty good. Um, well, thank you for saying that. I don't know. I don't know if I feel like a confident guy, but, um, I was so young back then. I just didn't, I didn't really know what to expect or what I was doing. I just, we just had this band and, uh, we started playing and we ended up getting a big following. I think a lot of our following was just based on, on our, like, uh, we were, we were really funny, like in between songs, you know what I mean? And we always used to have really big parties after the show. So, but you had to go to the show to find out where the party was. <laughs> yeah, are you talking about size 14 now? Yeah. Size 14. Yeah. 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 Well, so, your songs themselves were pretty funny too. So yeah. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Funny songs. And so, um, we got signed off a cassette tape. We had like a, it was like scribbled size 14. And there was a guy uh, at our telemarketing job who ended up becoming an A&R guy. For wow. MCA. And so he took us in and got us our first deal offer, which ended up falling through. But by then we were already playing like showcases and uh, we ended up signing with uh, a label called Zoo yep. uh, that had uh, that had some bands that we liked on there. Matthew Sweet. And, yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah, it was a fun experience. I mean, it was a whirlwind. We, it, we got we got signed in March. Our album came out in July and we got dropped in November. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
But I'm glad that our album came out because uh, so many other our, of our friends made really awesome, expensive albums and they never even came out. Never came out. Yeah, yeah. no, that that's I, I know a few of them. That's very true. Um, how, what inspired you to write songs like that? Because I mean, with, with that kind of sense of humor, the sarcasm, the, and of course, the, all the geek references that are in there. Yeah, well, I think Weezer was like an influence of just because, like, when they came out, there wasn't really anything like that that at least I had ever heard, and the 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 lyrics were so kind of quirky and matter of fact, and he's talking about like his Dungeons and Dragons dice and just things like you wouldn't normally put in the song. So it just felt very <laughs> freeing to just kind of like be, be who I was at the time. And I was, you know, my main uh, way of communicating with people is through humor. Um, so it was fun to put that in my songs. Like when I became Linus of Hollywood, I purposely tried to not be funny for the first few albums. Cause I was like, I want to be taken very seriously as a musician. And, and I remember playing those first few shows. It was very hard because I'm so used to telling jokes like in between songs. And I was like, no, I can't do that. No one will take me seriously. And, um, but size 14, <laughs> size 14 was just me being me. It was like metal references and obviously a lot of sophomoric humor. And I've always liked an interesting song title. I've always liked the coupling of pop music with either fun, funny lyrics or, or kind of dark or depressing lyrics. Like Delamitri is probably my favorite band of all time. And that guy is so good at like putting these like, like heart wrenching lyrics, almost dark, depressing lyrics over these beautiful melodies. And it's just such a great coupling, you know? So Justin, Justin Curry, uh, just like when he sat there with, uh, who was he, was he playing uh, with uh, Chris Difford uh, from Squeeze? He was on stage and he made Chris cry and Chris turned to Justin after playing one of one of his solo tracks saying, you know, that got him through his divorce and whatnot. And it was exact same time that that was getting me through my divorce. Like the, the whole, you know, if I ever loved you, uh, uh yeah. Lyrics and things. I never loved you. Yeah. Just, I, I, saw, I saw that video. I'd be crying. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that video. I just bought a Squeeze album and they had a song called If I Ever Loved You or something like that. If I Really Love You. Yeah. yeah. If I Didn't Love You. If I Didn't Love You. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't love you. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Justin Curry, uh, Delamitri, one of my all time favorites, period. And of course, not to bring it down, but the sad news about Justin with uh, with his, uh, the Parkinson's. Uh, yeah. But you know, I've seen him. I've seen him a few times in Philadelphia. Just him solo in a small little cafe and uh, enthralling. You know, yeah, I've seen him. I've seen him a bunch of times. And uh, he started following me on Twitter for a while, and I, I kind of didn't like it because I, I just like I hold him in such high regard. I just don't want to communicate with him. I don't. I don't want him like looking at my stupid tweets. You know what I mean? Like, it made me really uncomfortable. I'm like, I'm like, because I just I I view him as like a god almost so like uh for a while i had uh, i had this guy peter adams uh playing with me he he's a really great multi-instrumentalist and he was playing with justin curry so i had an opportunity there for a while to kind of meet him or get in with him and i just like i i, I don't, I don't want to know i got i got to talk to him one time uh, after show at world cafe live in philadelphia and uh um i looked him straight in the eyes and i, I said Tell me, tell me about the Uncle Devil, Devil show. Tell me, I mean, oh, I mean, I love that. and That's he looked, at, he, and he looked at me, and he goes, "I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> but I said, "No, I mean, I know you're trying. It was, you know, it's not you. It's a, it's the, it, yeah. But it's, it's such a such a great guy." He goes, "No, I wasn't involved with that." And he stuck to that. <laughs> he stuck to that the whole. I tried, and he insisted he had nothing to do with it because it was part of the part of the act. You know, it was, it's not Justin. It's not Delamitri. That was a, an alter ego band, and he doesn't yeah. play that stuff live, and he doesn't say he was even involved in it. It's uh, hey, Linus, be Linus, how these songs? I mean, they seem to be just listening to them. I get the impression that they were somewhat effortless for you to write, and that's not to diminish their their quality, not at all. But the lyrics just seem so natural, like. Uh, yeah, how, it, how easy was this record to do? It was really easy. I mean, I was a total alcoholic back then. I would just get drunk and smoke cigarettes <laughs> and, and stay up, stay up in my uh, my tiny little apartment with no furniture, and I would just like have all my beer cans around me, and I was just, I was basically just writing about stuff that was in my life. And it's kind of funny because 
when I write songs now, I really go out of my way to make them relatable to other people. But there are some size 14 songs that I don't even really understand why people like them because they're so specific and personal to my life. Like there's a song called Prototype that I wrote about my roommate who had just gone through a breakup and I was trying to make him feel like good. But like if you listen to the lyrics, you don't really you probably don't know what I'm talking about. So like that, that kind of makes me cringe a little bit. But I guess the 90s was was like that. There, there are other songs that are very classic, like Let's Rob a Bank. Like I could play that in my acoustic set now and someone would just think it was a line. It's a Hollywood song. You know what I mean? Well, I think what happened in this case, I can speak for me, is that even the songs that may not relate to something that people went and uh, happened, something that happened in somebody's life, you were very relatable as a person. So I think the reason people are drawn to even those other songs is because they identify with you just as who you are, even if they didn't go through it. Yeah, I think I, I, I can see that. Um, I, I play in this band called Nerf Herder and the, yeah. the singer uh, Perry has lyrics that are very like that. Like he, he says some pretty crazy stuff in those Nerf Herder songs, but the, his delivery is so kind of uh, sweet and dorky that you can kind of like forgive them and they're, and it becomes funny. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I I can I can I can get into that, but yeah, like like Claire Danes poster. I literally had a Claire Danes poster, like I had a bed that was like or was basically a mattress on the floor, and I had a Tiger Beat uh, Claire Danes poster that if you flipped it over, it had Jonathan Taylor Thomas on the other side from like Home Improvement, and so whenever I had parties at my house, people would mess with me and flip the poster over. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just became a joke because like everyone's like, why do you have this Claire Danes poster? So one night I just wrote a song and then it became our single and Claire Danes has heard it. And uh, uh, like not too long ago uh, on uh, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Claire Danes was a guest and the Roots played Claire Danes poster. She walked oh, in. No way. No way. <laughs> so I'm just like, you know, when I'm thinking like, oh, I was just a drunk 21 year old sitting in my boxer shorts. And all of a sudden now now this song is like, uh, that's how it ended up. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Uh, who? I mean, uh, one, th one thing I do have to ask you, I don't know if my daughters are, are still tuning in. But um, you've worked with you've worked with a lot of people you've you've written for. You've produced uh, a, 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 one, of, but one of the acts that I have to ask you about, which is my daughter's favorite act of all time, was Hollywood Ending. Oh, wow! Right on. Okay. Always eighteen and famous. So I'm texting my daughter today. I said, "You know, Linus of Hollywood's on the show tonight," and of course she's 29 years old, and she, uh, who? And so I said, "Well, he wrote and he produced." these songs for Hollywood ending. <laughs> oh my God, dad, you have to tell him that I'm a huge fan, you know? And yeah, I actually, I actually got her a meet and greet to uh, meet the band and have, and have uh, dinner with them in Philly when they came through and she loves Hollywood ending, but oh. an, an act like that, how, how do you get involved with a, a young band at that time? A very young band at the time. So most of my sort of uh, professional career has just, I, I sort of slide into these little pockets where I'm like doing a certain thing for a couple of years and then that kind of dries up and then I slide into another pocket. And uh, back in the size 14 days, there was a label called Drive Through Records. Oh, yeah. uh, they, they had Newfound Glory and they and they helped discover Blink-182 and Dashboard Confessional. And uh, I've been friends with the owners of that label, Richard and Stephanie Rains, their brother and sister. Um, and they wanted to sign size 14 back in the day. And they had just started drive through records. And we kind of went, oh, we're not going to sign to your little label. We've got universal records interested in us. And, and I, I remember uh, after we got dropped, us going, we should have signed to drive through because they ended up becoming huge. Um, All these warp tour bands they had, yeah. Yeah. But, it, but anyway, so uh, many years later, this is probably in the to late 2000s i guess uh richard and stephanie just started sending me we got back in touch and they started sending me their bands that they would develop like they would kind of meet bands and before they would like really commit to them or sign them they would have them work with me or another producer just to kind of like flesh out their songs and make sure you know what i mean see because a lot of these bands they were just like kids who were talented but they didn't really have their sound yet right yeah. um so when hollywood ending came to me they were they were they look like they were 12, but they're probably 16 or 17 or whatever. Right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, one of the kids was in, uh, was the little brother of, uh, uh, 
the guy from Busted, which is like a really big English band, and they, they all were yeah. They were definitely like put together, you know. They were all like different diff- from different places, um, and we we wrote some songs together. And I, I pulled in Jarrett from Bowling for Soup, and we and because uh, he and I were just doing a lot of co-writes, and so yeah, we just co-wrote some songs in my little Hollywood studio, and uh, I produced them, and uh, they ended up recording an All Star Weekend uh, song that I had written with Jarrett called One Wish that was on the Hollywood ending record. And uh, yeah, it was a cool experience. And I, I still keep in touch with those kids. One of the kids, uh, his name's Dan. He's he plays in Twenty One Pilots now. And uh, oh, he I don't know. I do, I do not know if my daughters know that. Yeah, uh, he, if you go see Twenty One Pilots and uh, you go look look at the guitar player, that's him. That's this little adorable redhead kid that was in Hollywood Ending, and now he's all grown up and has a beard. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I I I I was chaperoning the dinner, so I was eating another part of the restaurant, keeping my eyes on my daughters with this band, you know. Um, yeah. So you just you just made their night with, with the show here, talking about Hollywood ending and awesome. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually I really liked working with all those kids, and they they all like them, and uh, there's a couple other bands. There's a band called Sunderland that I work with, and they ended mm-hmm. up becoming Floor, that, and they're signed to Fueled by Ramen, and they're doing really well now, and. Um, it, it's very rewarding, and the, the most of them were so wholesome and like well behaved. Like I remember when I was a teenager in a band, I was so awful and egotistical and just like not taking care of myself and smoking and drinking. And like these kids literally are so polite, and they like listen to each other speak, and they're drinking like protein shakes and doing wow. P90X. And I'm just like, I'm like, wow, kids are so mature these days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's the take I got from the Hollywood ending guys is because they they looked the rock and roll part. I mean, they were they you know the ripped shirts and they the hair was with, with everything, but they were just the nicest guys on the planet. Uh, you know, having their sodas and a burger with with my daughters, and it, it was very just great. a thrill thrill for them. So yeah, what's really cool. funny is that below my studio, I had a I had a studio uh, on Sunset Boulevard above this restaurant called Toy. I don't know if you know. That. But uh, there was a coffee shop down there. And so when these boy bands would come to work with me, I would meet them in the coffee shop and then we would walk upstairs. And all, keep in mind, all these boy bands, they look like just they look like little kids, basically. But they have their, <laughs> their hairs all poofy and emo or whatever. And one day the guy at the coffee shop, he goes, it's a good thing I know what you do for a living or else this would be really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> just like meeting all these like young boys and taking them up to my studio. <laughs> now, among the litany, I mean, among the litany of people you've worked with, it, it, it's a who's who practically, are several hip hop artists, mm, yeah. which is something that a lot of people, if they don't know your career well, would be pretty, pretty surprised about. But of course, the one name that stands out above the rest is Puff Daddy. How did that union happen? And you had an interesting arrangement with him, as far as I understand. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. He's been making news lately, so uh, I don't want to give everyone yeah. uh, make anyone think that the interesting arrangement had anything to do with that. But uh, uh, no, no. When, I, when, when I was in uh, when I was in size fourteen, our manager managed this band that you know called Fuzzbubble, a great power pop band. Yep. But they mm-hmm. they got signed to Puffy's label, and so since we shared management, I got pulled into the Puff Daddy world. Um, basically, he was doing a remix. For one of his songs and my manager was like why don't you just submit a riff for this remix and so i played a riff on one of these songs and he loved it and everyone else that submitted a riff was like it was like dave grohl and billy corgan and rob zombie and all these like huge people so when it came time for him to start doing rock remixes i was the only like non super famous one so <laughs> he just started hiring me to play on his rock remixes so for about two years he would fly me out. He, he called me Guitar Man. I don't even think he knew my name. He's just like, Guitar Man. <laughs> Guitar Man, you got to come out and play on this thing. And so it was it was a crazy experience because it was right when he was just huge. It was like that summer of like probably like 99 or something uh, when every song on the radio was one of his songs. And there was like Mace and the Locks and all these things. And yeah, I'm like sitting there playing guitar and Jennifer Lopez is sitting on his lap. And it was it was very very surreal experience because he was just so big at the time that like uh it, it, it was it was fun to experience and he was super nice to me and he paid me well and i was in one of his videos and it was like fun fun experience i i have nothing bad to say about it and uh That's again going, going back to what i said earlier about 
the through line being pop, hip hop isn't really my first thing, but he he was really good at what he was doing. And I actually liked the songs and I liked the artist he was working with. And uh, and it was fun, fun times. Well, here's a, well, here's a question for you, uh, Linus. So when you say he was really good at what he was doing, how much a part of what he was doing was re- was he really involved with directing everything going on? Was he was he the mastermind behind it, or did he have a lot of people? Kind well, of- at least on the sessions that I was working, he wasn't like behind the board the whole time. He would kind of like roll in at the end of the night and say that's good or change that or whatever. But no, he he was more of a businessman curator. Like he had some really amazing producers. One of the producers I worked with the most was Mario Winans, who was part of the Winans family. Yep. Uh, so, and uh, I worked a lot with Michael Patterson, who is a dorky white guy like me. And he he mixed uh, Midnight Vultures by Beck, and and uh, uh, you know, like he's he's he kind of came from a different world too. And he, but him and this other guy named Paul Logus, who still masters my my stuff to this day, um, they they did most of the like sitting at the board kind of kind of stuff. Um, but uh, but and what's but, yeah. amazing is you're you're not even I I, I look at you and I say well, you're, he's not even that old you know yet because you still oh, have I am. <laughs> well I mean, I, I mean like us. compared to David and I we still look at, at you know uh, but you've worked with you know, not only a lot of uh, very named people All Star Weekend uh, Cheap Trick um, uh, what do I got here uh, Bowling for Soup obviously Paul Gilbert one of my favorites uh, but uh, you know, also uh, P. Hux wisely, some of the the, the best power. David power, Muir, David Muir, going yeah. on. I mean, at what point do, uh, do you ever sit back and go, "Holy cow!" I mean, yeah, just, I, I, I do cow. actually. I've I've been doing this thing on Instagram lately where I've been posting albums and just telling a little whatever first story pops in my head, and it's it's been a really fun exercise. But I feel like I've had so many, like sort of eras or lives or something that I just have, I kind of have forgotten like half the stuff I've done. And when I post one album, I remember, Oh, I should post this other album that I did. I just don't, I don't really think about it. I just sort of have blinders on and I'm just living my life and I meet people. And somehow I've been lucky enough to be able to collaborate with Roger Manning, who's my hero and Paul Gilbert, who I spent all these times when I was a kid learning his guitar solos. And um, I, 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 it's it's a combination of luck and just loving music and not being afraid to tell people that I love their music, which is another pet peeve of mine when people uh, meet their heroes and don't say, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like h- hanging out with Roger, you sort of get the impression that people don't tell him enough, like how important he was to them. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think coming, coming from He's very, you know, very humble. Yeah. Yeah, not well, only I, myself. I've heard, I've heard him say, like, when I asked him to play on my Triangle record, he was like, people never asked me to play on their record. I'm like, what? Like, people just assume, oh, he's too expensive or I'm not good enough or whatever. And I like, think that's it, yeah. But well, I mean, there's a there's a bit of an intimidation uh, point when, when you when you kind of not the word idolize, but uh, you know you put somebody on a pedestal who you think is just fantastic, and if you are if you are a musician or if you're from a label if you're from this and and you get to speak to somebody like that, I mean, you figure in your own mind you're like, well, I don't want to say what everybody else is telling them, which is I love your music. Everybody's got to be telling them that, you know. And so I think there's, you know, I think there's a way to do it though without being ridiculous you know what i mean oh, like sure. you, just, you sure. just sort of get it, get it out of the way like i could just be like roger i just want to tell you i grew up as a metal kid and hearing jellyfish like totally changed my life and da 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 and then you just get on with yeah. being human beings together and friends and peers and you don't have to carry on this dynamic of you know you're up here and i'm down here or whatever um well i yeah i've i've told my daughters that a lot because you know i i said you everybody's a human being and you just treat them as a human being and and, and talk to them. And, and David and I have had a lot of experiences with this show and just talking with people. We enjoy yeah. the interaction and, and, you know, we are, we are just both or all of us just rolling along this planet together. Let's uh, let's enjoy the ride. So uh, especially when you are someone like a jellyfish or a Delamitri, like those bands, like they have their fan base of people that love them, but they kind of don't get the, the do and the respect, you know what I mean? And so yeah. you have these people who have made this amazing music and they're, probably walking around going like, Oh, no one really likes my music because <laughs> people don't tell them enough how important it is. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. I mean, they're, com- they're, they're comparing themselves in that regard to their heroes who hear it all the time. Yeah. Um, if they and would people- compare, 
if they were to compare themselves to the other people in that same sphere, they'd realize that they do hear it a lot more than some of those others. Right, 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 true. Yeah, that totally makes sense. But they don't, you know. But yeah, like some, some of the people I've been the most uh, freaked out to meet have been people who haven't really sold that many records. Like like uh, I met uh, the singer from Eggstone, which is like a Swedish oh, yeah. band I love. Love Eggstone. I, Eggstone's I, think, awesome. I think I was more nervous to meet him than anyone else I've ever met in my entire life because I just like the, the, way, the way that that music is and the way that they look on their album covers and my whole like uh, idea of Sweden and all that, I sort of like... It's almost like he lived on another planet. So when I met him in person, I was just like, <laughs> "Have you seen that? Have you seen that documentary um, that came out on the Swedish pop scene of the '90s?" Oh, yeah. oh the one that's on uh, uh, Net Netflix or whatever. The yeah, it's on Netflix now. Yeah, this is, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's on Netflix now. Yeah, it's you're all about. about you're yeah. talking about the one where they 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 uh, interviewed Max Martin and all that kind of stuff. No, I don't think Max Martin is in the, that documentary. I don't no. think so either. No, it's all it's all the the '90s wave of Swedish power pop, like like uh, who's all uh, I'm blank all of a sudden. Well, this, per, this perfect day this is in there. The wanna dies. The wanna dies. I know the cardigans are in it. Um, oh, no, uh, I've not seen this. Oh, Dorian Gray. Yeah. Um, a lot. Of, yeah, a lot of those wonderful. Um, uh, Tommy sixteen. Um, everybody's is it? It's, it's great. You, you got to check it out. Yeah. Oh. And of course, the Merry Makers are in there too. Merry Makers, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh my God, I, I feel uh, ashamed that I don't know about this. This is like I only learned life. about it a little while ago. So yeah, I didn't know about it either. It's been out for a while. I, mean, I have an ABBA tattoo for God's sakes. Whoa. <laughs> I love it. So let let me ask you. All right. So the size fourteen happens. You get dropped, unfortunately, and then. Not long after that, a couple of years later, I get this cassette from you. And like I mentioned, uh, which thank you so much for sending, for even thinking of me, because all we had done is, you know, we had met at one of your size 14 shows. And I guess I must have made an impression. But anyway, um, and I, I was just so overwhelmed with how good it was and how different it was. How, what, what got you to shift gears and start writing that kind of soft pop? Well, I think even when I was in uh, size 14, uh, when I was on the bus, I was listening to Odyssey and Oracle and all this like uh, 60s pop kind of stuff. And I was also, the, the major label experience was very, um, it was a, kind of a helpless feeling because uh, we just submitted to this big giant machine and then we ended up getting you know dropped and it was just like very depressing. So it was sort of a combination of me wanting to start my own label and make my own records. And then also just wanting to try and make a record that sound, sounded like all the stuff that I was listening to on my headphones, mostly Beach Boys, Gilbert O'Sullivan, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I had an 8-track. I had one microphone. I wonder if I, I still have it around here somewhere. But I had an 8-track. I had one microphone. I didn't even have a compressor or anything. And I recorded that whole album in my bedroom. Wow. Uh, and then I took it to my friend Bruce Whitkin, who mixed it and did a great job. And uh, I didn't think anyone was going to like it. And then you helped the cause. And then it took off in Japan randomly. And uh, and then it just turned into a thing. So then I started a label. And I'm like starting to want to sign other people in my community. Uh, Kim Fox had just got dropped from DreamWorks. So I made her a record. David Ponak, I loved hanging out with. So we did the Mellow Cads record. Yep. Willie Wisely, we did a record. Uh, even Gabriel Mann, who's like basically my boss now, like we did a record for him. Uh, yeah. So we just tried to, I just wanted to learn how to make records and I was having fun doing it and it just turned into, turned into a thing. Did you end up going to Japan and playing? Yes, a lot. A lot. Yeah. My first gig in Japan was a like 3,000 seat theater. Um, wow, and we the Mellow Cads went. We all we all went. Uh, it was super fun. There was a label that we signed to in Japan called Filter, and they were a yeah. division of Sony, and they did all those cool uh, album covers that you held up <clears> earlier <throat> in the show, and uh, they were great. I mean, they treated me like I was on a major label. I would go to Tower Records in Japan, and there was a giant Linus of Hollywood display in the middle of a store with like all these like little props and. So like I did an in store. I played a lot of shows, uh, and then I also. Um, I also, 
there was like between 2000 and 2010, I was going to Japan like two or three times a year because I was, I was playing solo shows. And then I was also playing with Roger and then I was playing with uh, Paul Gilbert. So I was just like going mm. to Japan constantly. Um, it was super fun, super fun time. Now, how's your Japanese? Uh, actually, Paul was uh, teaching me for a little bit. He's a really good teacher, and uh, he made this like little book with all these like cartoons, so I could remember remember words. Like the Japanese word for um, birthday is Tan Jobi, so he drew a picture of John Bon Jovi getting a tan, so I could like remember <laughs> the word. <laughs> Just like little things, like little tricks to remember. Um, so I actually got pretty decent at it for a second, uh, but then the next 10 years, I didn't go as frequently and I kind of got out of practice. So I know, I know some basic words, but uh, it's actually a pretty easy language to learn because there's only five vowels. So like the, like learning how to write it or read it is really hard, but learning how to speak it is actually not mm. very hard because really? there's, wow. yeah, cause they don't have genders, you know, like uh, German, right. German has like a gender word or whatever. Uh, it's pretty yeah. just like cut, cut and dry, I think. <laughs> it's fascinating. I love it. Well, all, <laughs> Tangible. You know, you, all your albums are a little bit different, but they they still all have that thread of soft pop, power pop, melodic pop, the whole thing. Um, do you think do you think you're going to continue to write in that style for the, the rest of the albums that you put out? Yeah, I mean, I think you've noticed that I have a lot of like side projects and things like that. I, I basically I have a whole nother album that sounds like something that's more akin to Size 14 and Nerf Herder and all that kind of stuff. If I if I end up recording that, I would just call it something else. But Linus of Hollywood is a very like fixed fixed thing. And as long as I'm doing it, it's always going to have that basic sound. You know what I mean? And those those sort of guidelines, I definitely definitely have some some borders around around that so like I, I wouldn't put out something crazy and call it Linus of Hollywood that sounded like completely different from everything else and how how, how is Bowling for Soup doing these days they're doing great they 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 keep me very busy um Jarrett the singer is uh he's doing country stuff now well wow. uh, so he's doing really good and uh they're constantly just putting out singles and I, I think I've produced all their records since like 2008 so they're like one of my main, my main uh, employers right now, um, but they're just super fun, and it totally makes sense for me. It's like that style of music is right up my alley, um, so it's just easy. Oh and fun. yeah, for sure. Easy and fun. Uh, so are we? Uh, are, are we going to be seeing uh, Linus of Hollywood uh, release again in the near future, or is it just uh, something that's organic? It'll happen when it happens. Um. I definitely I've been wanting to do a Christmas album for a super long time. So I'm really oh, wow. gonna try, I'm really going to try to do it this year. And it will definitely be super like soft pop Gilbert O'Sullivan strings and horns and like as Christmassy as possible. Uh, so it'd probably be like half covers, half originals. Wow. Um, so I kind of want to do that just to kind of get back into the Linus swing of things. Uh, and then I kind of just want to think of like how I want the next record to be. Like I always sort of have an idea in the mind, like like Cabin Life is really funny because that was supposed to be my rubber soul. Like I wrote it up in the cabins and I, I wrote everything on this really shitty acoustic guitar. But then when I started producing the songs, I got like, I couldn't help myself and I ended up producing it like I usually do, you know, instead of <laughs> keeping it sparse and sloppy like rubber soul is. Um, but it's cool to have kind of like a blueprint. And so I'm trying to think of my next my next blueprint of like what kind of album I would want to do. Um, sometimes I think I want to do like a straight up power pop. There, there, there's that band, the Uni Boys that I love. They're like a new, oh yeah, yeah. a new band, and I just I listen to that. I'm like, man, I could do an album like this. That'd be so fun. Because <laughs> I love I love the knack. Like the knack is like the, the blueprint for that kind of music, and it would just be so fun to do a record like that. I assume you've heard the Lemon Twigs. What, what do you think? Oh yes, oh yeah, for sure. What's hilarious is I, I've been doing some uh, teaching at uh, Cal Poly Pomona. They have like a song songwriting course, and so I go and I do these like panels and I help them coach or whatever. And there's a kid that's in the Lemon Twigs and the Uni Boys. He's the kid with the the giant afro. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. His name's Reza. He was in my class. Wow. And, and during the pandemic, we did everything on Zoom. And I remember Zooming with him and it was like a group of people and he was in his bedroom and he was showing me all these power pop records that I hadn't even heard of. And I'm just like, who is this kid that literally looks like he's been trans, you know, sent from 1978 and he just like was turning me on to stuff I hadn't even heard yet. Uh, 
And then all of a sudden, I go to the Troubadour, and he's in the Lemon Twigs. And I'm like, hey, there's that kid. And he's he's <laughs> super talented, super sweet. But, yeah, the Lemon Twigs are amazing. And the new and single. I'm, new single. They have, yeah, they have an album coming up that's much more power pop than anything they've done. So. Yeah, I've been on board with them since the beginning. Um, they put out a couple albums that were kind of like – uh like they're so good at music that i think they were trying to show off how good at music they were and i i I call it i call it punishing the listener where it's just like so many chords and so many rhythms that it's like almost not enjoyable to listen to you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and i I don't it's hard it's a little work yeah yeah like i have friends that are super into like jellyfish power pop stuff and they just can't get into the lemon tricks because like they think it's too sort of obtuse or something like that however everything harmony amazing album they're starting to write songs now and then they put out four or five songs from this album that's about to come out and it's just mm-hmm. like it's yeah perfect. they're they're done showing off and now they're just gonna write amazing that's, songs. that's a I'm yeah that's well put actually yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, so, they're really great live i've seen them a bunch live and they're great and it's it's fun to go because i see every all of our friends there darian and it, it, it's so funny because like the half the crowd is like all these like really cool looking 20 year olds and the other half is uh as us basically <laughs> we're in the back with our arms folded <laughs> their dad ronnie Dario, was a great songwriter in his own right um i've known him since the early 90s he had a band called the rock club kind of a dumb name but they had put out a really good record and um not not long ago he released a lot of songs that he'd recorded in the 70s which are which are wonderful he played ipo new york about seven years ago and the two kids the two lemon twigs kids were his backing band oh my god um i you know he said these are my sons of course they weren't lemon twigs yet but mm-hmm. i i got to know them through that and um yeah, i'm I really just, proud I of them i just saw a youtube clip of them when they were really little kids and they were playing music and it was it yeah. was really cute and and i have heard uh, the father's uh music I, I i found it probably a few months ago and i i turned on a couple of my friends to it and they're like i think i listen to the dad's music more than the lemon <laughs> <laughs> In some cases, yeah. It's really good. Well, yeah. Well, listen, Linus, thank you so much for being here. Um, we look forward to what comes next. If I'm able to make that show, I will, because it's right in my wheelhouse. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, you've done so much. We're really proud. And um, thank you for, you know, all you've done for the pop music scene. Well, thank yeah. you guys for having me, and thank you for doing this show. Um, I was looking at some of your past episodes, and I realized that you uh, interviewed the guy from Pilot, who I've been totally geeking oh, yeah. out lately. So I need to go back and watch that whole uh, that whole thing. Well, I mean, and Gilbert, Gilbert, nice Gilbert O'Sullivan is in the archive. Yeah, we had Gilbert. We oh, interviewed him too. Yeah, I yeah. Gotta, I, gotta, I gotta go back and, and see. I saw I saw the I saw the Roger one. Uh, yeah, Pilot yeah, is like. Pilot's like one of those bands where I just assume they only had the one good song, and I found no. one of the, I found one of their records, and it was like two bucks. I'm like, oh, what the hell? And I'm like, this whole album is amazing, and so like, yeah, literally their whole catalog is, is it's awesome. great. Yeah, and David Payton, such a nice guy too. So you know, unassuming and just humble and wonderful, wonderful gentleman. Unlike yeah. me, who comes yeah. in. The- <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. Well, if you, if you want to keep up with all things uh, Linus of Hollywood, Linus Dotson right there is his Instagram going across the bottom of the screen. Instagram, just uh, search at Linus Dotson, and uh, you can hear what he has to say about the albums in his collection and, and things uh, uh, and everything going on in, in his world. So, uh, awesome. yeah. and Thank you to everyone who has made comments. I've sort of, I've, I haven't sort of haven't I haven't shut my mouth long enough to read them all, but uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, oh, here's one comment. Are you work any more working with Jeff Whalen? Um, so, he was one of our early guests, by the way. I think he was like our fourth. Yeah. Episode. yeah. Oh, amazing! Oh my God, I love Jeff so much. Uh, we hang out like probably once a month. He drives up from Long Beach, and we get lunch, and we talk and talk and talk. Uh, I would love to do another album with him. I don't know what his uh, what his current vibe is. He's working with that other band, Brother Steve, and uh, yeah. They're great doing yeah. random stuff, but yeah, I, I would lo- I, I love Jeff. He's one of my favorite one of my favorite humans. So it'd be fun to do another record. Well, we look yeah, forward. To, awesome. We look for, we yeah. look forward to everything you're involved with, uh, Linus. What a what a wonderful career so far. And as we said, you're still you're still on the young side of the spectrum as far as Dave and I David and I are concerned. So uh, you keep having fun, keep enjoying life, keep doing what you're doing, and and we'll be listening, man. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Right, for our pleasure. Thank you. All right. Have a See great you soon. night. See, See you, buddy. Thank you. Wow. Yes, David. Great guest.
Man, what another great guest. Holy cow. What a Very, talented uh, guy. I mean, you, you look at the people he's written songs with and it's it just uh, or worked with, and it's like every genre. And uh, to, to hear that he's been um, catch, checking up the archives and, and loving some of the things that he's seen us do, again, that gives us, I think, a little more vim and vigor and renewed faith that people, whether it's live or checking out our show in, in the archives, it's it's well worth it. You know, it's well worth doing this. So uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That was a lot of fun. He was uh, very engaging, very engaging. And of course, uh, my daughters are happy. If you're still listening out there, we talked about Hollywood ending. I got it in. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, they haven't chimed in, so. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Well, they're flying home tonight. That's what she said, John. That's what she said, John. Yeah, my daughters are flying home from Orlando tonight. They've got a wedding to to attend uh, this weekend, but they're just in and out. So um, that's what she said as well. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. That, oh, we could have gone on with that interview for three hours. He's just he's just so much fun to talk to. And of course, we didn't even we didn't even like get to the tip of the iceberg of all the artists he's worked with. We could have we could have just asked him about each artist for the next couple hours. But um, yeah, when he gets when he gets a new release coming up. Especially we'll have him back. Right? We'll have him back. Yeah. We'll I mean, back. I gotta I gotta start packing soon for this trip. All right, man. And um, but, uh, what what do we got coming up? We got we got a great show next week. If uh if people want to tune in again, awesome. Next Wednesday. What's going on, my friend? Well, next week, um, let me find the record. Where to go? Okay. Next week we have man who was one of the front men of an amazing 60s pop band called The Circle. Had huge hits, Red Rubber Ball and Turn Down Day. Yep. Red Rubber Ball, co-written by the great Paul Simon. Um, they wrote a bunch of awesome songs in their own right. Two wonderful albums. And a third wonderful album, which just came out a few weeks ago, called Revival. And it's on the great Big Stir Records label. Yes, we're talking about The Circle. And we've got the main man of The Circle Still with the band, still writing. Uh, Don Daneman will be with us next week. And this record's really good. It's, uh, it's called Revival, but it's not just a cash-in on what they had done before. It yeah. is, it's very vital with a bunch of new songs, a, a few. Uh, the, they do uh, Turn Down Day and Red Rubber Ball, but it's bonus tracks because they want this album to stand alone. Yeah. And uh, it, like I said, it's a really good one. So... Uh, if you're a fan of 60s pop, I would highly recommend that you uh, that you join us and definitely check out this album and uh, pick it up if you can. Good stuff. Um, after that, we're we're wide open. We're we're always looking. We'll I'm sure we'll find some people, and if we don't, that's okay too. It'll just be um, Mark and me shooting the breeze about whatever. Yeah, we'll uh, talk about new releases. We'll talk about, you know, we'll, we'll do our material issues top five. It could be top five songs. It could be movies. It could be Twilight Zone episodes. It could be anything. We'll have fun with the top five list. Um, you know, it, it's going to be good. Now, farther down the road, we do oh, have... right. Yeah. The, Minx, the Minx soundtrack. The Minx uh, being a... I, don't, I think it was a softcore porn film, actually. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, and somehow, yeah, we've got to ask Don how he got... How he managed to get songs into that. That's got to be a great answer. We have to know, yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of that album's instrumental, but there are, um, yeah, there are definitely some circle vocal tracks on there too. So. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure after after next week, we will probably end up with uh, some more guests in that interim. We just haven't booked them all yet. We always have irons in the fire, and you never know when something's going to pop up. Absolutely. Uh, and then down the uh, down the road, actually on June 12th, we just booked it. Uh, Vivica Sagastad and her husband, Ken Fox, Vivica of uh, Weld and of her own solo material on my label, Pop Detective, uh, and of course on Sony, a major label in Norway, and then Ken Fox of the uh, Flesh Tones, uh, that's her husband. So the duo, both of them, are going to join us June 12th. Vivica's back out now and playing live in the you know, greater New York area with all her solo material you know her three solo albums and her christmas album if it was christmas time and the 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 why nots which is her other uh group that she plays with so it's gonna be great if you that's down and that's not that's a little far off it's down june 12th so uh we'll tell you more about that when that comes up but and of course, that, 
And of course, at the end of May, um, we'll be in, uh, <laughs> right, exactly. We'll be in Liverpool doing IPO. We'll do our usual uh, live broadcast <laughs> from IPO Liverpool. Yeah, I love I love last year when you interviewed some of the bands backstage. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. we'll do that again for sure. Um, in fact, you know, we kind of schedule some cool ones right around that time. That'd be great. Maybe our friend Mr. Borak will join will join as he has the yeah. last couple of years. That'd be and, great. Uh, that should be fun. And yeah, I'm I'm sure we'll have guests in the then, now, and in between, as the King said. So, just uh, stay tuned. Always yeah. check us out at materialissues. Doc, uh, the Facebook page, the YouTube page, uh, for what's going on, and um, yeah, David, everyone, have a safe uh, have a safe trip uh, tonight. You know, <laughs> bless you. You know, safe. I hope it doesn't rain for the uh, Fenway Park. Uh, yeah, I really. Yeah, I mean, I've never been to a game at Fenway, and uh, if it rains out, we're not. I'm not going to be able to, to, to make it up unless they make unless they do a day night double header the next day. Yeah. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that uh, that it that it does get played. Well, good vibes. Good vibes. So, Thank you. It's all good. All right, yeah, love love Tarina, and as John says, says, go Orioles. <laughs> this is a family show, or no, no, no. All right, everybody, have a great night. We will see you next Wednesday, six p.m. Eastern, three percent, three p.m. Pacific, with Don right Danneman of the Circle. Don Danneman of the Circle, right here, live on Material Issues. Take have care, a great everyone. night. Have a great week, weekend. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.